live the life you love. All right, we are live. I'm excited to introduce everyone to Mr. Justin P. Slaughter back on the show and his good friend, MC King Khan. Welcome, guys. How's it going? Hey, nice to have you. Yeah, so we got a two for one today. So Justin's been on the show, so we got to have your backstory a little bit. But I guess I'll start with MC King Khan. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you and what you're currently involved in, what you do in, in the music industry. Uh, thanks so much, Ben, for, uh, for having me on, Justin. Thanks so much for having me uh, let me join um honestly uh i mean i've been doing i've been doing music for since middle school but originally i was born and raised in moscow russia um moved to the states back in 2004 lived in dfw for a little bit um and for work i moved out here to beaumont um i've been always doing music you know as like a professional hobby um a lot of it was centered around myself and uh but just lately especially with this uh quarantine um you know i'm just just making moves, you know. Uh, I would, uh, got to work with Justin. You know, we completely met just by chance, really, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> just got got to talking and networking, you know. And here we I, are. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> here we are. That's awesome. Um, it, looks, it looks like you guys are in a studio. Tell me about this the studio that you guys are in. Uh, so this is a uh, this is my at home setup. Actually, um, I do all my all my work here and this is what my wife complains the most about <laughs> as far as like me being in the way but uh you know i said uh basically you know i set it up to have a professional sound so i don't have to go out to the studio a lot because i whenever i record i obsess over the track a lot so if i need to do 50 takes on one verse i'm gonna do the 50 takes on one verse and you know, not every pro not every producer or engineer is necessarily going to have the patience that you know <laughs> to work with that. So, um, and I work with other artists too, uh, some locally. Um, you know, no, nobody nobody quite you know big time just uh, just yet. But you know that that's kind of my focus. You know, uh, to get artists to come in, work with a diverse group of people, and learn from everybody, and just make my moves and make my stamp on the industry. Awesome. I definitely get into to gear and everything in a, in a minute, but. Justin, it's been, I think, three years we talked about since you've been on the show last. And yes, done a oh lot since. So a lot of diving into movie stuff now. Uh, catch us up a little bit on what you've been up to. Yeah, man. Oh, my God. Yeah, it has been three years. It's, wow. Yeah, so, you know, I still do my fitness. Um, I still do personal training. Um, well, not right now due to COVID-19. Right. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an actor. I'm an actor now. Um, one of my biggest roles I've done, you know, I played in the movie 90 Feet From Home with Shawn Michaels, Dean Kane, Eric Roberts, Adam Hansen, um, produced by Tiffany Benton, director Brett Benton. They're amazing. And, um, you know, I wanted to bring back my music. You know, that's still, you know, music is still my love. That's still my heart. But um, this whole three-year gap, you know, I was able to rekindle my love with acting you know i went to school for acting um so finally getting that golden opportunity um during hurricane harvey and from there you know i've been able to like get deeper and deeper into this into this career and um you know when i first got back into acting i didn't tell anybody because um I had a little issue with my confidence mm -hmm. um i wasn't mentally strong yet to say yeah i'm gonna go into acting because all it took all it would have took is one person to say, um, no, you can't do it, you can't do it. And that would have easily just kind of crushed me. So I kept it to myself until things got publicly, publicly known where you know I did Pepsi commercials and things like that. And um, now that I have another movie I'm getting ready for called The Clearing, I'm actually on prep for this film right now. Um, I play a character named Darren. He's, uh, He's in a very secretive organization and he mm -hmm. wants to recruit his wife, Liz. So the mission he puts her on is very, it's very gruesome. It's very gruesome. It's a horror film. Okay. But um, <laughs> so right now I'm on prep for that. And um, while doing that, I'm able to still, you know, coexist my music, which is why we'll be releasing Ride With Me featuring MC King Khan. Yes. <laughs> And I heard the track. I love it. I, lo I love the chorus. The chorus was stuck in my head the other day when I was getting ready to, <laughs> to go out. So I was like, if that's stuck in my head, that's a good sign. I guess tell me a bit about the singles. At the time, by the time this will come out, the single will be out already for about a week. Uh, tell us about the, the single and how you guys maybe met and collaborated on this. Well, I also um, have a deal with a TV series. 
Mm-hmm. And they was they picked up on uh, just the reference track of the song Rob With Me. And they wanted to put this song into their episode. And, you know, we were going over contracts for, you know, residuals and things like that. And I said, well, this is only just a rough draft. I mean, I can get it mixed and mastered. And he said, well, great. Well, you get that together. We're going to get a contract together. So, you know, you can we'll have it played during this episode on this TV series. And then people can go out and purchase it. So I was already trying to get my head together. I, I want to get a feature on this song. But, you know, I mean, I love the solo version, but I would love to have a feature. And it's just so happy, you know, I went to T-Mobile to, I want to say to get another, I went to get another phone. And that's when I met, <laughs> that's when I met this guy. And, you know, I, I know most of the people there and they know that I do acting and I also do music. And I was hearing that he does music. So we kind of started networking right then and there, you know, we switched contacts, you know, I left, but I was really intrigued. I was really intrigued because I heard his music. And I was like, wow, this guy's really good. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this can be the birth of something cool. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I went to my friend's, um, my, my friend's son's birthday party. And um, after that, I went by his house to check out the studio and I'm listening to all his work and I'm like, it wasn't no doubt. I'm like, okay, I need you to, I need you to get on this track. I need you to get on this track. So I, I gave him the 411 on, you know, where this song is going. You know, I can only give so much info because once we sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement for like these uh, TV series, I can only say so much. Sure, sure. But um, so with the song, you know, I was able to get MC King Kong on the track and then Luke Pimento to do the mastering. And um, now, you know, the song comes out tomorrow but you're going to be hearing it a lot once this once we once the ball is rolling from covid-19 once production starts this song will be you'll be hearing a whole lot of it on this show and it's, it'll be on Netflix awesome that's exciting did you guys record the the vocals in King Kong studio or yeah he recorded his he recorded his vocals in the studio mine was already pre-recorded at my studio so we did the the old fashioned you record yours, email it over, we transfer yeah. it. Once you get it together, then we'll send it off to Luke Pimento. And Luke Pimento, man, he's an awesome guy. I've always wanted to work with him, man. Like, he's a magician. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> I've always wanted to work hey, with him. Co- coincidentally, I-, I was getting to know Luke also, and it turns out he worked with a lot of Rus- Russian artists as well. So oh, it's cool. kind of like meant to be, you know, type of thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been here from, from Russia? Like, were you born there and moved here? Or? Yeah, I was, I-, I was born and raised in Moscow. Um, so, uh, 92 is when I was born. So I came here in 2004. Um, and I, I still go back and forth. Like I still have property over there and uh, most of my relatives are here now, but yeah. That's awesome. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in the studio that you, that you have, um, what, I guess getting a little bit into some gear stuff, cause there's so many, so many different directions we can go with this conversation. We'll probably get into all different kinds of things from movies to producing to, whatever else we'll see where, we'll see where the conversation takes us. But I guess for someone that wanted to start a home studio, right? I work with a lot of artists. I have a lot of artists that listen to the podcast. They're are starting to build like their own studios. Um, I don't know if you have some, some gear at home as well, Justin, where, that you kind of do some pre-production with, but what is like a good DIY beginning setup? Insulation. No, I mean, it really, it really kind of depends for podcasts. You really don't for, need for music. much more than, for, for music for music oh for music um for music podcast you, is it <laughs> uh, for music you need some type of acoustic treatment in the room uh it doesn't have to be like all like out like this but it does need to have some um some good acoustic treatment so you can control the reverb and that unnecessary sound that goes in um it, you don't with modern technology really uh with all the plugins that are available and you you can literally spend probably five to seven hundred dollars on this on a studio and put out quality things like um, Billy Ellish, if I'm not mistaken. Ellish, yeah. uh, so her her f- first album was completely recorded on a MacBook. Like, really? Huh. Yeah, her. All, so you, it, it just really depends on like what your talent level is and how much work you really put in because. You're going to be learning, like, if you do it all on your own, the mixing and the mastering, those are separate things, as well as vocal training. That's a separate thing. Um, cleaning, isolating the vocals, making sure your initial levels are right. But to be honest, all you need is a is a digital audio interface, um, a musical interface. 
you don't if you're doing just you you need mm -hmm. one or two mic mic plugins and just basic acoustic treatment yeah. mm -hmm. and really that's all you need because even um trey songs he did that he uh, recorded that song uh, i need a girl mm -hmm. at his friend's apartment it's mm -hmm. actually on yeah. youtube he recorded oh, yeah? like a, he didn't have like a professional studio but we hear the song today song is professionally like it's, it sounds amazing yeah, yeah. that um what was that 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 song um I'm gonna take my horse to the old time road. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, he, yes, the guy that made the instrumental is this kid at a university in Netherlands. And he bought the beef from him. And he just happened to get the exclusives. And, you know, after that, if you make something catchy, it's gonna, it's gonna go on. Now, yeah. the consistency, if you're gonna be consistent with it, you need to maintain some type of level of production, obviously, sure. to get better. So that's, that's a different thing. But like, if anybody can make a hit, but right. if you want to record yourself consistently, do voiceovers for maybe like movies and additional, because you can use the studio for more than just one thing. Right. right. And yeah. um, so if you want to do stuff like that, then you'll want to invest into some additional equipment like preamps and, you know, faders, mixers. But just to just to get going, man, I <laughs> my very first first song in middle school, I recorded. You remember that thing on, on the computer? You had sound recorder on the PC. Yeah. <laughs> I had a sound recorder. I had it next to a speaker and it was playing Dear Mama by Tupac, the instrumental. And I was nice. rapping over that. So that's, <laughs> that's, awesome. that's how my very first song recorded, man. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of YouTube video watching. I'm going to tell you that though, because yeah. there's, there's great, great content on the internet available for absolutely free. Yeah, and knowledge is definitely there. Yeah. It's just, mm -hmm. there's so many tricks you can use. Are there any specific YouTube channels that you guys like to follow for to like learn about production and recording? Uh, I follow Beat Stars. Yeah, um, yeah, they they put out pretty good content. Um, I can't remember some on top of my head just now, but I have some that I subscribe to a lot. Um, Even certain artists, um, you you can pretty much watch a couple of videos on YouTube of uh, certain artists recording their, their hit singles. And mm -hmm. from there, you can actually pay attention to what's going on. Like you realize like, oh, that, that's not really an expensive mic they're using. Man. So it kind of gives you, it kind of, you know, reiterates, you, you really don't need thousands of dollars to, on, on a studio setup where you could just spend just a couple of hundreds and you could still get that same quality yeah. that you're looking for. Because uh, a lot of people just like, they price themselves out and they don't even like want to start. Uh, Self-doubt is the biggest thing for any artist, really. Yeah. I mean, like if, if you if you don't have self-doubt, then I don't I don't know. But like Eminem had self-doubt to the you know, so everybody everybody has that, and we all just want some type of level of appreciation, right? So absolutely. Yeah. Um, and with artists, you just you just gotta like you just gotta start it, and then you mm -hmm. if if it's meant to be, man, you'll meet people along the way. They'll help you out. They'll give you direction. You things like this will happen out of nowhere, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, definitely, internet is a great, great, great resource. This is a great learning. time to learn too. Right before we started recording, we talked about how a lot of people just kind of are sitting around making excuses while COVID is going going on and waiting for it to be over i mean what if this lasts until 2022 you're going to sit around for another year and a half and do right. nothing like this is a great time to right. learn to experiment to meet some people like you guys have and, and collaborate and i mean collaboration is what it's all about too and and we talked about consistency talk a little bit about on on that like like how to find motivation during times like these and the importance of consistency uh. With everything that's going on, it's easy. It's easy to let all the bad and you know the toxic things just just fill you up. You know, it, it's hard. It's actually hard to be consistent, and it's hard to push through it. Mm -hmm. But for what you want, what you want in life, what the things you want to succeed in, you have to want it just as bad. You have to want it so bad that <clears throat> it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if if uh, smallpox just started coming back and, and like now we got all these other types of issues, you still have to want it as bad because one thing I tell myself that gets me through the day and I, and I tell myself this all the time, you know, we can't live forever. And whenever my time comes, I will at least have a sense, like I will have this, this, this um, 
confidence knowing that I did all I could, mm-hmm. you know, and my family, my friends would know, like, you know, with Justin, like, yeah, man, he had a, he had a great life, man, he, he, he said his mom was from, he never gave up, like, he went against all odds, and, you know, he made it happen. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, we only got one life, you know, people say YOLO, you only live once. Well, mm-hmm. you only die once as well. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you got to take that, you got to take that and, and utilize that because, there's somebody out there in the same position as you who's working two times as hard, three times as hard, four Mm -hmm. times as hard. So let this be a reason for you to push harder because, you know, you have to be hopeful when this, Mm -hmm. when this pandemic like just lifts, you're going to see who's been working and you're going to see who's just been sitting around, but you got to want it as bad as you, you got to want it. You have to want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like you talked about before we start recording, right? You can't, like you can't you can outwork talent but if you have talent then you can it's it's amazing what you could probably could do if you have that work ethic but if mm. you're sitting there and you're like oh i'm not as talented as as this person or that person like first of all like stop comparing i think comparison is one of the worst maybe mental illnesses i don't want to call it a mental illness yes. but it almost is like a mental illness if you just like compare yourself to others constantly and you know like the person that might be more talented right now may have no work ethic and if you start going exactly. in and start working and you're learning and you're grinding when I mean, we talked about i learned how to animate logos yesterday and i don't think i'm talented at that but i feel like if i kept working at it i could probably now start adding some animation to some of the things that i do so it's like all about having that work ethic and you can outwork talent but if you have talent and imagine what you can do if you have have do both right Mm-hmm. I remember I saw this quote. Um, I forgot who who made it, but the quote went like, "No one should beg you to be great. No one should beg you to be great." Mm-hmm. And you know, I know we've probably seen it a lot. Like you know, we see people with so much potential, but they don't really do anything with that potential. Mm-hmm. So it's like you know, it's just like what you said. It's like you know. Hard work beats talent every time. Mm-hmm. But if you have the talent and you have the hard work and you put it together, like, man, you are a force to be mm-hmm. reckoned with. Right. Yeah. And it's like, like I said, what if someone, if you get back to the comparing thing, right? But well, what if the person with talent starts working hard? But what if they don't? Like, just exactly. work and be the best version of you and just keep working it. I mean, you're, you're a prime example of that. When you, I mean, Speaking of like, you know, like last time we got you on the podcast, you almost died of a motorcycle accident. Look at the amazing things well, you yeah. have done since. <laughs> <laughs> it was an incredible story. Like what you've been seeing, what you've done after that and what you've done even since last time we talked. Um, just inspiring to see like how hard you've worked. Yeah, that's still my motto, man. That's still my, like having a second chance. Like a lot of people don't realize like every day they wake up, um, every day they wake up, you know, that, that's your chance. Yeah. And when I had that motorcycle accident, oh, I prayed. <laughs> I prayed, man. Like, um, and I used that, you know, with everything I'm doing. Like, I, I can't, I can't let my life go to waste. You know, I, I did that before, and it almost cost me big time. So, you know, now I have a second go round. So, what am I gonna do with this second chance? Am I gonna do a repeat, or am I gonna grow from it and be something more than I ever thought I could be? Because, um, you know, one of my biggest dreams is to see other people win as well. I feel like you're not winning until you actually help other people win. Yeah. When everybody's winning, that's like, that's like one of the greatest achievements. Because for me, I know that it's not a dream because everybody else is experiencing that same type of, you know, realness. Mm-hmm. I told you, if you can build a community and the people are in your community are succeeding and are just as successful as as you are and you guys are building each other up that's what it's really about right that's where it also comes in with your your training like like not only are these clients like clients they're also like partners and friends and what you're doing because the harder they work at those things the more successful they are going to be in everything you do because they all like if you work hard at something that translates into translates into everything in your in your life absolutely yeah so going back to so during these times right you can there's so much you can do. You can learn, you can start buying some gear, start playing around with gear, start producing stuff. So talking about gear, what, you can talk about interfaces, getting an interface, getting a good mic. What are some of your, 
favorite, I guess, like specific type of gear. So for podcasting, I don't know if it's similar if you're just recording vocals, but like I have a, a focus, right? Which I know a lot of people use uh, the, the Audient ID uh, 14 and 44 is like that whole series uh, is a really good series. Um, I know there's things like Mike's, um, like I guess the industry standard is using an SM57 or 58 Assure mic. Uh, I thought a Sennheiser would be better because like, I'm not a production person. Maybe you guys know more than I do, but I know there's like omnidirectional, unidirectional, and you want like a certain mic for vocals. So I guess, what are some of your favorite mics and interfaces to, to use that you've experimented with? Ooh. Well, my all-time favorite mic for me, and they, they came out with upgrade versions of it, but for some reason, that specific mic works perfect for me, and that's the Sterling Audio ST69. Okay. Now, Sterling Audio came out with the new, they came out with these new models, like the ST169 and the ST159, but I'm like, if it ain't broke, <laughs> don't break nope, it. Yeah, don't fix it. <laughs> now, believe it or not, the interface I use, they actually discontinued it. Um, really? It's actually the Avid third generation Inbox Pro. Okay. But Avid doesn't do any more home studio um, equipments anymore. They, they focus mainly on, you know, these mainstream bigger studios which is why, you know, Focus for I mean, they've been pretty much killing it by storm. You know, they have all these different models. And it reminds me of the Avid generation of, you know, of inboxes. But man, like the Sterling Audio ST69, that's probably going to be my all-time favorite because I even went through the Neumann TLM 102s. Even though they're more expensive and, you know, the Neumann, they're pretty much a very popular brand. But just because it's popular doesn't mean it may work good for you. Right. So I, I, for me, the ST sixty nine is like perfect. Yeah. This guy got some nice. He got some nice stuff. Yeah. Uh, what, what about you? Well, <clears throat> as far as far as my interface, Focusrite Scarlet probably the most popular one. This well, I have the four channel third generation one right now um, okay. that I'm running. Uh, my microphone, this uh, it's a Aventone MC twelve. It's a condenser mic. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's really nice, it, but it it requires um you know it requires a forty eight the phantom power, mm -hmm. so on top of it I'm running a, a DBX two eighty six preamp and you know to to get more power into it and it also works as a half compressor also in the meantime mm -hmm. and then a, a a big a big overlooked factor on a home studio or really any type of studio where you have a lot of wires running around is a power conditioner. Um, so like I have one of those because a lot of times with the wiring running around because you have running through different circles circuits for me preamps and interface and back um, that static will feed into the mic so mm -hmm. power conditioner really helps out with that on top of it protecting you know from any kind of surges um, and monitors I feel like kickers rockets they're they're the classic I've had mine for like over five seven years and absolutely no issue with them nice. so but. I definitely think that the focus right, the Scarlet is probably the most popular interface right now in the market and it's probably the best for the budget, you know, for your uh, home, for your home studio and mm -hmm. just additional, you know, preamps and stuff like that that you want to do on top of that. Now, what about software? What are you guys like using? What, what have you experimented with? And then what are, what's like your favorite um, editing software and, and why? You use Pro Tools, don't you? Honestly, I don't. <laughs> I use Logic Pro. I, I okay. use Logic Pro because um, you know, first guy I worked with um Vinny D. He's uh he's actually out in Miami. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he said, Jay, he said it doesn't really matter what software you use to record with. As long as you bounce those vocals the right way, I'm gonna mix and master it on my end using Pro Tools. So it doesn't right. matter what you record with, as long as you don't come in too hot. And you bounce all the files over if it's either WAV format or AIFF or AIF, you know, we're good to go. So after he told me that, I mastered the hell out of using Logic Pro. <laughs> now, because I'm just so used to it. I'm, I'm just so used to using that software um, where there's so many different um, softwares that's out there. You know, Pro mm -hmm. Tools is pretty much standard, industry standard. But um, you honestly probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference when it comes to um, the final product of a song. If somebody used um, Fruity Loops, Logics, uh, Pro Tools, um, mm -hmm. what other softwares are there? There's Sonar. There's Cubase, yeah. FL Cubase. Studio. Uh, to, be, to be honest, uh, like unless the artist, unless you're the artist that does your own mixing and mastering, it probably won't matter to you much what what mm -hmm. you use. Um, but now to the producer and engineer, that's what 
whatever they're more, more most comfortable with. You know, mm -hmm. people say Pro Tools is the industry standard for recording. Uh, I use FL Studio for everything, um, but that's because I know the most knowledge of, I have the most knowledge of it. I know all the tricks I can do in it. I know how I can do uh, automation and things like that. Um, and I'm familiar with the standard plugins that it comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, I've used Cubase before. Cubase is really good. Uh, it has a really good pitch corrector that comes native with it, but it's not very user friendly. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of that, but it's whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think a lot of producers use FL Studio for like beats, just make it, making instrumentals and then they'll bounce it and then they'll take it to Cubase or Pro Tools to record the actual artist. But it's whatever you're more, more, more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And speaking of beats, do, you, do either of you guys produce beats or if not, like where, like how do people know where a good place is to find like legitimate beats where they're not one getting ripped off, but also like everything on the, the legal side is done like correctly in the right way? <clears throat> well, I first used to go on SoundClick. Mm -hmm. And then from SoundClick, I found this one beat producer, Stephen Lee. Oh my. <sighs> Stephen <laughs> Lee, this guy. He he made some he actually made the beat for Ride with me. Okay. And um but he like he just stopped he stopped doing beats and everything and um from there, I connected with um, Nick Lascombe, and he did the beat for Old Movie Body, um, Crazy, no, uh, a different producer made Crazy. But what I did was, I started building these relationships up with these beat producers, mm -hmm. and now I let them know what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And instead of having to go to these, these websites, they already hear my music, so they know my style, so they can make a beat for my style. And um, even Relapse, um, there's a new song called Relapse. Um, I don't know when I'm gonna release that one yet though, <laughs> but I don't get to do the whole month to month. But Nick, Le um, Le yeah, Nick LeCombe, Le 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 God, if he hit this podcast, please forgive me, man. I don't know how to pronounce the last <laughs> name, but he made, he goes by Triple X Productions. Okay. Yeah. So he made the beat for Relapse. So he already knew my style. Once he heard the reference track of it, he said, bro, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. He said, when are you gonna release it? That is the question. Um, I'm not sure. It could be next month. I don't know. But it's nice. done. It's definitely done. It's <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> that, uh, I used to go to SoundClick a lot also, but then mm -hmm. quality kind of dropped off over there because but, but when trap when trap entered the music, it, it it killed it killed any other type of artist trying to get any kind of experimental or any really anything different out there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it for me, honestly, I go through a lot of beats on YouTube and I put, find a producer song there. And right now I work with like two consistently. One is Daniel Cruz and the other one is Rock Legion. And he was uh, partners with Benny Hanna. But honestly, I, I, whenever I go look for beats, I check their stuff first um, mm -hmm. they're, they're, because I feel like they, like they don't make any custom stuff for me or anything like that. But I feel like I connect with their type of music style. Mm -hmm. So I'll check, you know, I'll check them out first. And then um, uh, some producers actually will reach out to you, man. Uh, Rock Lee, the, after I bought one of the track outs from him, he reached out to me and he he actually said, like, hey, I listened to some of your music. I heard it on Spotify. And really, I want to be part of your journey. Uh, so they gave me a free beat to you. Awesome. Um, so cool. Now, as far as the legal aspect of it all, so a lot of these producers, they don't want to get rid of the exclusive rights. Uh, they will give you like an unlimited lease, but they won't give you the exclusive. So even if you do get the unlimited lease and stuff like that, they're still going to get like a 25% share and stuff like that. If you, they'll send you a contract mm -hmm. with it. Ex explain um, the difference between those, those two, uh, so for, for sort of listeners can, um, can learn. So basically an exclusive lease, uh, an exclusive beat, you own absolutely everything about it. Nobody has to know that somebody else made it. You mm -hmm. don't have to say anything about it. Like, as far as anybody's concerned, like you made that beat on your computer. Mm -hmm. um, an unlimited lease is you have the publishing rights to it. Essentially, you get you, you get unlimited plays on a radio. Uh, you can use it for distribution and the music and stuff like that. But you have to credit the producer and any kind of distribution service that you use they're going to be getting a composer share or a publisher share or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it may be 
like it's usually no more than like 25 percent or 50 percent um but you basically it lies within the credit because those, those people like if if your song blows up they want to make sure that you know they get the credit so they get more customers come and get their stuff so mm -hmm. um if you some some producers will let you negotiate for an exclusive like mm -hmm. yeah Scott nick Spence. yeah nick and um steven you know we, we wound up doing a negotiation for exclusive rights but um even though I, I have exclusive rights i still like to you know give them their credit because it's, it's a relationship that you know i build with them yeah. so it's like you know they're, they're good to me you know i'm good to them you know there's going to be other artists that may want to get beats from them exclusive yeah. rights is really protected from liability yeah, yeah. so if, so you, if you're doing an unlimited lease can other people use that same beat for other songs got it yep. so test. You so have for, a, for, they, for audio version yes <laughs> yeah they, they lease the beat to you for a period of time I imagine, I imagine like if you really, like if I really wanted and I had the money, I could probably hit up the producer like, hey man, I'll pay you five thousand dollars for the for the exclusive. Like he probably won't say no because he probably didn't get a lot of offers like that. But if you're a big time dude, or if you just, or if you just know your stuff is hitting, man, you might not agree to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then on like an independent level, when you get an exclusive beat, well, because like if you do it on a major label level, like level like usually the producers will get some kind of upfront fee and then there's a back-end royalty. Do these producers try to negotiate a back-end royalty after like whatever you've paid for to beat gets recouped? Like how does that work? Um, it's very rare. Honestly, okay. as an independent artist, it's very rare for a producer to want to get something on the back end because to be honest in the real world, upfront mo fee is high enough. Yeah, <laughs> most, most producers, if they feel like, you know, it, you know, it's a business, you know, they make a beat, they sell it. Sometimes they may come across an artist and like, you know what? I may need to renegotiate this contract. I, I think I heard about this guy. But sometimes they may just like, oh, well, it's just gonna cost as much you just take this and, and, and this and that and, and be done with it. So mm -hmm. it just, it, it varies. Mm -hmm. Like, um, if you were a label, most producers, they're gonna wanna negotiate because now they, they, they have something worth negotiating. It's right. not your song. <laughs> you on the label, and it's not your song. Exactly. So now the producer, they're able to do a negotiation because they know right off the bat that they can get something on the back end or they can get what they pretty much, the ball is in their court now because mm -hmm. that label needs to get this beat. This beat was already done. You know, their artist did the song. The song is great. It's going to be hot. So the ball is in their producer court of how much they want to push numbers. And if it could be a suitable number where they can say yay more than nay. Because if a producer wants to come in with an outrageous price, then it's nothing for the label just to back out. And like, okay, we're just going to scrap this song and start all over and get somebody else with a better price. So it, it varies on it, who. It, it, it's kind of, I feel like it's kind of like a, a sacrifice on the balance. So if you want the label's marketing power, if you want the production power, like you don't have the upfront capital cost to pay for production and beats and licensing and stuff like that, you sign with the label, they do all that for you. Right. But they pretty much take like everything you make off of streaming right. and, and anything off of album sales and stuff. So then you come to touring and you got to make your money just off of touring and, you know, appearances, sponsorships, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other ways as most independent, most independent artists that are like, that are legitimately trying, they probably own most of their music so mm -hmm. ideal that is the ideal scenario the ideal scenario is that you have a large following mm -hmm. and you got some producers that you work with that you just pay an upfront fee and that's all your business and you mm -hmm. own the music you own the rights and you have your own following so now you know you got the marketing set with that mm -hmm. um but if um the the only time the producers are really going to be like wanting a, a back-end share is like if for example if you work with them a lot and they want to sign you and they're they're going to negotiate something with you uh but if you're not signed most producers don't own anything yeah because they even do that with even engineers like uh, there's a different price for independent artists and signed artists right um where independent they're actually catered to independent artists on the finance part but if you're a sound artist, then you're going to be spending a little bit more because it's actually not you that's paying for it, but mm -hmm. the label that's paying for it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Give me like a range. Like, don't, don't tell me like what you guys are like paying for, for beats, but if for the artist that's out there that's trying to find some beats to, to either lease like unlimitedly or to like buy exclusively, 
like what is like a range starting out like not maybe at where you guys are at but when they're first starting out like how much should they pay for leases and how much should they pay for like just owning the beats because i've seen different ranges i've seen beats for as little as 50 bucks or even like 25 bucks um but then i've seen even like a couple thousand dollars for beats i've seen beats um where exclusively mm -hmm. you could get um a beat exclusively for maybe 300 400 it's hard to you can get a lease for maybe 10 15 bucks you can get like an unlimited lease for maybe uh 100 or 150, 150 is what i pay for the yeah, 150 bucks so i mean <clears throat> it varies depending on it also depends on the producer because mm -hmm. the more popular a producer right the greater the, the fees are going to be i will i will say this is my two cents on it mm -hmm. If all you're purchasing is just the instrumental, like you're not actually paying the producer to mix your stuff, like if all you're just purchasing the instrumental, um, the difference between the beat that you pay three hundred dollars for and a thousand dollars for is going to be minuscule. Mm. Yeah. It, yes. it, it, it's it's going to be very like the only reason that that producer is charging you a thousand dollars is name. because they've been in the game for a while, they got connections, uh, or you know, really they they just got the name out there. Yeah. It's right. kind of like it's like Gucci, Fendi. Walmart brand type stuff. Or, or, or right. Coca-Cola yeah. and, 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 and cola. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, like, like Nike or K-Swiss. <laughs> yeah. The, the, only thing, the only thing that the price may fluctuate is because it's more subject to negotiation is the exclusive part. Mm -hmm. But as far as like the unlimited leases and stuff like that, man, you shouldn't be paying more than two, three hundred dollars for them. Unless you really dig the producer or like sometimes you find the beats like, I got to have it. Like, mm -hmm. I right. need to have the track outs to this. Um, and that's, you know, as an artist, man, you can be spontaneous like that. But right. in my experience, the difference, once you get to the, that pricing, like 300000 eh. Got it. So you, an ideal world, you want to make a really probably fine, if you're just starting out, find a producer that's also kind of maybe a little earlier in their career and find maybe like a handful of producers that you just work with all the time. Because you want, we talk about consistency a lot too, like being, so that even like the sound of your music stays consistent. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I mean, there, there's something to be said about experimenting also when you're first starting out, where you're, you're still going to be searching for a style. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I, I find myself sometimes experimenting too. Like, for example, I'm not signed to anybody. I don't have a promoter or anything. So they, like, when I work on an EP or a demo, I'm going to have some different range so I can show my range. Mm -hmm. So I can show that, you know, I can go across spectrum. But as you develop, you know, yes, you, you do need to have a level of consistency, especially like the quality of your sound needs to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Like you can't go from having like a really good track to something that sounds like they just made it on GarageBand. Like yeah. it's not, <laughs> um, but outside of that, man, artist is about expression, so. Mm -hmm. and you also mentioned sometimes a producer will, will sign an artist. What does that mean? Does that mean you can only work with that producer? Like what does what is, what does it mean yeah. to get signed by a producer? So I've had it, so, Back when I was living in DFW, I had a, a one of my best friends. He was trying, you know, he was trying to make it on the local scene, and the studio they used to go, he would go to record for like the first year or so. He would just go in there as he was developing, also. But he would go in there and just record and pay for his tracks. Um, and eventually, they they just they just offered him a deal. They mm -hmm. they they liked the the progress that he made. They liked the um, they liked the following that he was building. They mm -hmm. And more, more importantly, like the consistency, he was there all the time. So they knew he was investing time. So, you know, sometimes you can get lucky like that and a producer will just see something in you and uh, they'll just offer, hey, you can come here before. I, I feel like if you don't have like a, if you're not a big artist, you kind of really watch out for that because like somebody can just sign you to something and you'd be really excited for. And then like they control your social media, they control your YouTube channel. As soon as there's mm -hmm. a dispute, you're locked out of that. Like right. that happened to my friend. Like they had a dispute with the manager, and the manager deleted all his stuff on YouTube. Wow! And so, you want to be careful. Like always, read what you sign. And mm -hmm. Just don't ever just be rushed into anything. Uh, mm -hmm. To talk to people about it, and mm -hmm. you know, because I feel like if somebody's offering you something and you don't really have a following, then mm -hmm. they probably see some markability in you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you want to leverage that like in, in your negotiation you know, don't want to just say you don't want to just give up all your profits for free studio time for example right. exactly. um, so that's just kind of how i view it that's part of the reason why i try to do as much of this like from graphics to videos everything as much as myself 
And, and the thing I always teach is what, one, one of the guests on a podcast before was an entertainment attorney. And he said, whenever you're presented with something that has words on it and you have to sign it, you should always talk to an attorney first. And usually when someone presents you with a contract, right, they're going to always gonna present you with their most ideal scenario in the most ideal world. This is the contract you're going to sign. So you have to like almost like think about, okay, what's your most ideal scenario? And then you counter with your most ideal scenario and hope you guys meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I feel, I think Justin probably has a lot more experience in the negotiation aspect of it, <laughs> as I'm still currently unsigned. But I do read it and I talk to him a lot about it to so get knowledge. So, but I don't know if there's anything you can learn. Uh, you know, when it comes to contracts and negotiations, um, the reality there are sharks. Sharks are in every yeah. industry. Unfortunately, yeah. And if it's they true. see that you're wide-eyed, if you're a wide-eyed artist, they're going to gun for you. They're going to mm -hmm. gun for you because they, 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 they see that you don't know better. They, so right. they'll try to make some type of deal, a sweet deal, and it'll sound amazing. Mm -hmm. And being that you're trying to get in there, like, man, I got to get I got to get And so well, did you look at it? Like, yeah, I looked at it, but you only looked at just, like, so much, yada, 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 and you missed all the, the bottom, the back, and the other um, sheets. You missed where everything that you make oh, is there and you get you get 10 percent you get 10 percent i'm saying uh, it's based on experience i didn't sign a contract but i read a contract friends were like bro you didn't sign it like, whoa hey man hold on now nah, i don't want to get bamboo no like this it seems too good to be true right. now you know so I, i'm reading it and luckily one of my clients one of my personal training clients is actually an attorney okay. so she's a, well, well jay let me look at it right quick and say, Jay, you do know that you're giving up everything just for 10%. I see that's, that's going to be a no for me. That's, that, that's going to be a no for me. The yeah. moment I saw 10%, um, the moment I, are we back? Yeah, you're back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the moment, the moment I saw 10%, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. 10%, that's, that's not good. That's not good. Because mm -hmm. the only thing I can think of for 10% is like agency as far as acting. When right. you join the union for SAG after, then your agent gets 10%. But if you're not union, then your agent gets 20%. They only get paid when you get paid. Mm -hmm. So in the music field, you know, a lot of artists, it's very wide-eyed. Right. And you got to be careful. The first deal you get, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, most times that first deal you get is, is not going to be a good one. Right, yeah. The best okay. deal is going to be the hard one because you got to negotiate. You have to know your worth. So, mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and speaking like doing things DIY, right? And doing things now during this time, I mean, the more value you can build on your own, the more you can build your audience, the more consistent yeah. you can be with content, like the easier it's going to be for you to negotiate. Because if you have one hot song, but you have a thousand followers on your social media platforms and then a label comes for some reason, it's gonna be the worst deal ever. But if you have a hundred thousand followers and you have two albums out and you're already making money doing music full time like you have leverage and you don't have to take that deal exactly like yeah. the, the biggest contract disaster in the music industry right now is this happening with kesha and her producer yeah her rooms, I didn't know that was a... oh yeah man he yeah he was bad they had like a it started off as a romantic relationship and then it fell sour and he locked her out of getting she can't do no new music like there's a whole court yeah it's sad man Oh, interesting. I know she, she's on that. Um, yeah, she's finally able to do it. Yes, yeah, because I know she's on the uh, the Greatest Showman. Um, Remember, she's been on for like yes, five years. Yes. yes. Oh, that was a while. Yeah, she was gone for a while. She was like a long yeah. hiatus, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was bad. So, Justin, you mentioned oh. uh, since you mentioned agents, you mentioned like movie agents. Um, I want to get a little bit into into that territory, but I guess tell me about the the first movie that you did. How did that come about? What was the movie? Were you part of, like, how did you find out about the auditions for it? Like, tell me how that all came together. Oh, man. The <laughs> very, very first movie I've worked on. And it wasn't, you know, it was it was an extra role. But, you know, it was, like, it was like a hiatus, you know, from being in school for acting and then working this on straight fitness and music, finally mm -hmm. getting back into, you know, the film industry. The very first film I worked on was Marvel Studios, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Oh, wow. And I worked on that around the time Hurricane Harvey was coming. 
So, you know, I met Evangeline Lily, Paul Rudd. I actually got lost. I got lost on set. I didn't know where I was. This was in Georgia. I was in Georgia. I was in Atlanta. And the 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 hair maker I said, Yeah, just meet us at the meet us at the trailer. Okay. So I step out back, trailer, 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 trailer. <laughs> I'm trailer. Like, I'm like, so which trailer? So I walk up to these people talking, not even knowing that it was Evangeline Lily and Paul Rudd. And I was like, excuse me, do you know what the um hair and makeup trailer is? Yeah, we'll show you. Like in my head I'll be like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and they so Paul Rudd said, Man, so look at those arms, man. So you work out a lot? Sometimes. <laughs> I was like, Sometimes. So, I'm so <laughs> glad to know that Paul Rudd is chill. So, so they walked me over to the trailer and you know, the way they talked to me, they didn't talk to me like I was an extra. They talked to me like I was like just like them. That's cool. And um so from there, you know, after we filmed, we wrapped up and everything. And shout out to uh, shot back home to Texas because we was all talking about Hurricane Harvey. And I said, I actually live in I actually live in Texas. And they said, You're driving back to Texas? I said, Yeah, I mean, I, I love my car. I said, How many like how much does it cost for you to drive? I said, honestly, it cost me sixty dollars going wow. and coming. My car is phenomenal on gas. So <laughs> I drove before Hurricane Harvey made landfall. And, you know, from there, you know, something really struck in me. Like, I, I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable, like, as a extra. Mm-hmm. That's not what I wanted. But I needed that to kind of get over that, that fear of being on a live set. I needed mm-hmm. that to build a confidence. I needed that to network because that I did network. I networked with the casting directors. I networked with... Um, David Desmaltian, he played in Edmund and Wasp. He's the one that said Bobby Yeager. But, um, you know, we were, <laughs> it could have we totally gotten me to say yeah. that correctly. So, yeah, I could have. I could have. I could have. So, you know, this networking with all these people, and, um, you know, I learned, you know, even Paul said, you know, it's good to build a relationship. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, God. Paul Rudd just gave me like this solid advice. Like, yeah, build a relationship. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm gonna build a relationship. And then from there, you know, I've still doing a little extra work. Um, but then I met Cal Chandler on Godzilla. And he gave me a solid advice saying the same thing, build a relationship because you never know who you're gonna meet who can take you to that next level. Mm-hmm. That was my first day as an extra. The next day I came back, Cliff Lanning, the second AD, bumped me up to be in the double. Uh-huh. For um, what is the guy name? Uh, I forgot his name, but it's on it's on Google. It's literally on Google. I forgot the guy's name, but I was his double on Godzilla King of Monsters. <laughs> and um, so he so Kyle looked at me and said, "Man, I, I heard that this, that somebody got promoted." I'm like, "Yeah, somebody did get promoted. You sure you don't have anything to do with that, man?" He said, "Oh no, I don't. I don't know anything about it. Well, whatever it is, thank you. I really appreciate it." And then from there, you know, we talked a lot. Me and Kyle Shannon, we talked a lot. He actually lives in Texas. He lives out here. Uh-huh. And um, he said he stayed close to Matthew McConaughey. And, you know, we talked about burgers a lot. Daddy O's Burger, like ranked right number two in the nation out here. And I even met Thomas Middleditch from the, the Verizon commercial and just building that relationship. I'm just, I'm soaking in. Yeah. I'm soaking in so much knowledge from them, just so much. And they said, yeah, man, once you get there, once you be able to get that that audition, like like try to like do your best to land it, you know, get that role, secure that role, make sure you you continue to build these relationships up because nowadays you can have all the talent in the world, and sometimes people may not give you a chance, right. but if they know you, if you if they know you and they know that you're working, you know, they can actually vouch for you. Like yeah, I I know this guy, you know, he's in acting class, you know, he's always on time. He comes to set thirty minutes early. Like I vouch for him they can get you these these bigger roles but mm-hmm. you know the hard work is still there so i still had to do auditions and that's when i wound up getting a little cameo in avengers endgame if you ever get the bonus edition the, i want to say it's like the hd hardcover copy of uh, avengers endgame and from there you know i met robert Downey jr and it was like everything was coming full circle he said the exact same thing build that relationship mm-hmm. build that relationship up and I'm like, okay, this is a sign. I, I'm so being I'm a personal trainer, I'm not a shy guy. So right. I love to talk to people. So I, I'm easily going, like, hey, good morning, man. Hey, how's it going? You ready? I'm, re- I'm ready. You ready? So I'm ready. <laughs> so, you know, just small talk, you know, building these relationships up. And then, you know, finally getting the audition for 90 Feet from Home and then meeting everybody from there. And HBK. And yeah, meeting HBK. <laughs> you know, he came in my trailer while I was sleeping. He said, hey, Jay, man, you ready? I wake up, I'm like, 
<laughs> Starstruck. Star <laughs> 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 H- 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 and I'm like, I right, see so ready. I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Yes, I'm, I'm ready. Oh, man, you, you, you're hot, you're cold, you're thirsty, you're hungry. Like a uh, meat trailer, suit trailer, man. Like I got everything you need. And, um, <laughs> You know, from there, you know, still building relationships up and, you know, working harder. And then it came to the point after doing a couple of films, a couple of commercials. Now, all these are now supporting roles, lead mm-hmm. roles, supporting lead, featured, uh, principal. I wound up having the perfect resume to submit for an agent. Now, having an agent in the film industry is different than having an agent or a manager for music. Right. You know, for, you know, in the film industry, you know, agents get paid when you get paid so they have to so they want to find you the best work the highest mm-hmm. paying work the work that can that can take you all the way because they you know they have bills they have family so the company needs to be paid and um i signed with aisha king with pure flair and believe it or not um that was the fourth time i've submitted for that agent you know i always feel like you know shoot for the stars Whichever one is harder to get with, that's the one you should get with. Because if you can get with an easy agent, right, it might not be that good. But if you can get with a hard one, like one that's very hard to get, then you know you're in good hands. And right. I've submitted to so many agencies, and I submitted to them four times, and like three times they told me no, and like it was it was bad. Mm-hmm. Four time I had a, I had everything ready, and I talked with Aisha King, and everything was going great. You know, the interview went great. Got off the phone with her. You know, I didn't want to get my hopes up because the first time I had a conversation and I, and I wanted to get to know, but she told me, you know, we have a great feeling about you. Like you, you're ready, you're hungry, you're, you're working, you, you're in class. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to make a bet on you. I'm willing to see how far you can go. So if it's a yes, you'll get a contract from the Screen Actors Guild. And one of the great things about having an agency that's franchised with the Screen Actors Guild is, you know, that it's a professional agency right. you know that they're in the, in the right in the right um the right area for you to be in so once i got that contract in from the screen actors guild like that was it man like that was yeah. like that, that was that was perfect still, also cool because there's the only union that still uses the word guild yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> think about that <laughs> so yeah man it's like um i'm just you know and i'm very thankful for everybody that i've I met along the way to get me to this point and you know and i'm still not even there yet even though that you know i have films already on the, i'm on contract with you know i feel like i'm not there yet until i get more people there until i get mm-hmm. you know to is it, it becomes more of a because out here in texas there's not really it's, it's not it's not really a lot, not not in Port Arthur, Beaumont area. So right. I feel like once everybody else is on, then I feel like okay, now we're doing something. Now we're mm-hmm. now we're getting something. Yeah, I, I'm gonna break some of that down for, just to give them some steps for people that want to get into that. But before I do, uh, can kind of, you seem pretty excited about the the HBK thing? Are you an old school wrestling fan? Because I I, I certainly oh am. my goodness. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Man, I was so on the Attitude Era, and then really. Probably up until like 2008, I was really following it. It went very kid-like after that, you know, mm-hmm. but I was, yeah. Back in Russia especially, Stone mm-hmm. Cold, The Rock, Undertaker, uh-huh. all those guys, man. HBK, uh, what was that, D-Generation X? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That, Justin, you're a wrestling fan? Or? Absolutely, man. I <laughs> 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 On the day three of film, me and uh, me and I'm um, Sean. We're in a makeup chair, and I'm looking at him. He's looking back at me. He he squeezed my arm. He's like, "My God, those bumps was like so hard." I was like, "Yeah, man. Like, I mean, they're not like yours." I said, "I said, Sean, man, can, can I call you Sean?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "Can I tell you something?" He said, "Sure." I picked you every time on the game. I picked you. Every, I didn't know how to do sweet chin music. I didn't. I tried to press every button, but I, you know, but I picked you every time, man. Every time. I was That's like, awesome. man, this is gonna suck him out to jack you up on film, man. It's gonna break my heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. Where do you find opportunities for extra work? Because as with everything, right? As with even with beats, like there's always opportunists out there trying to take opportunities, uh, take take advantage of people um, that don't know better, and you know, maybe like they're trying to sell something so you can be on some list that 
gets yeah. you opportunities. Like where do you find, I guess, opportunities for extra work to kind of start building your way into TV and film? Um, well, first and foremost, you know, everyone definitely want to be mindful. Be careful of like these other sites, like uh, Casting 360, all these, those are scams. You know, they, they want you to pay for these memberships. Right. And you get and then they'll they'll send you like these casting calls. Yes, the casting calls are real, but those casting calls are old. Mm -hmm. Now, legitimate casting agencies are central casting. Now there's a central casting in Louisiana, a central casting in Atlanta, Georgia, on a Peachtree Drive or a midtown of Atlanta, Georgia. Peachtree Street. Yeah, Pe Pe Peach Tree Street, yes. <laughs> um, there's a central casting in California. There's a central casting in New York. There's CL casting. There's one in Florida, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So Savannah, I want to say Savannah casting. There's so many types of casting companies, and they're on Facebook. They actually have pages on Facebook. Easily to join, easily to follow. You know, they could, they'll, they'll sign anybody because they'll get paid when you get paid when they book you. Mm -hmm. um, you, you go there. You take some pictures, they get your measurements, and they'll automatically, you get text messages or emails of casting calls. You automatically submit. Now, when you get that, you know, you can get casted in like the, the highest budget film ever, biggest budget TV show, commercial, whatever. But the biggest thing that you don't want to do, you don't want to get complacent. Mm -hmm. Use it as a stepping stone. Don't mm -hmm. get complacent. I, I met a lot of friends. I met a lot of colleagues, um, people you know, um, from working on Godzilla, from working on Avengers, you know, every, you know, a lot of people got complacent, you know, mm -hmm. they stayed doing extras, you know, right. like, no, use it as a stepping stone. If you right. want to get, if you want to get to Z, use point A as a, as a building block to build block B, block C, D, E, just to get to Z, you know, because, you know, a lot of people today, they meet these, these, these actors and actresses and they, you know, starstruck, they get so starstruck that they, find themselves in complacent. Oh, I got to come back here because I want to see these people. Why be like that if you can actually work alongside with them and exactly. you can actually be on the roster with them? Right. So, I mean, it's, like I said, it's good for experience. It's good for experience and it's good for um, breaking that fear of being on the live set, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be complacent. Now, you can make a living being an extra and that's when you're pretty much bumped up to being a featured extra where you do yeah. get camera time. Sometimes you may even get a line and once you get a line, you automatically become SAG eligible to join the Screen Actors Guild. Right. So there's so many ways around it. Like if I wanted to do this, I would start. Or you could Boy. do student films. But to student films, you know, like independent films, you know, if you're on a big budget film as an extra, I guarantee it'll break your shyness because you're around so many people and all these cameras, spotlights, boomsticks, mics under your wards, all these things. You know, a lot of people get nervous when that's once they're in front of those these big old IMAX cameras. Is it student films? Student films. Yeah. So you can either do that or you can do student films. Now, auditionforfree.com. Auditionforfree.com is a website you can go to and you can see casting calls, audition calls. You'll see those same casting calls like you'll see with central casting and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. you can still submit to them. Now, only thing about it, if you were a casting agency, they can vouch for you better, just like a talent agent. They can vouch right. for you better. Mm -hmm. When you get one of these casting agencies, do you, do you go actually physically go in and is there like a process or do you fill out some information online first? Do you get pictures taken first? Like how does that process work? Uh, central casting, yeah. Central casting, you actually have, have to go there in person, take pictures, do an interview, all this stuff, fill out your W nines and all this stuff and everything. Because it's it's an actual, you know, acting is a government job. Right. You know, when we get paid, you know, there is a you know federal withheld and all this stuff, so you mm -hmm. actually get paid a lot, you know, like from the actual payroll company. And uh, but CL casting, uh, Katret, hers, you know, you could just follow her on Facebook. It's uh, CL casting. And she will always post casting calls. She'll tell you how to submit because that's one of the big things. Make sure you follow directions. They'll tell you how many pictures you need to submit, your name, you know, phone number, address, you know, are you willing to work work as a local hire and everything. And you know, from there, you know, you can easily get in. Got it. And then student films, that's basically when when colleges are doing films and they're looking for roles to fill 
for those films? Like, do you, be, do you go to those colleges? I don't know, yes. groups for those colleges? Yes. So even on auditionforfree.com, you know, you can see casting calls for student films. You know, you go there. They'll send you a script to look at. And, you know, that's if you're ready to start doing, you know, more supporting and lead roles. I always say start off with student films because, you know, you can there you can actually, like, see where you're at. Mm-hmm. And, you know, instead of trying to submit for, like, a big budget film, and they may not even contact you to audition. Mm-hmm. But if you start off as a student film, you know, they're looking for somebody that they can fill for this role for their thesis. And uh, from there, you know, you still have to audition. And from there, you actually can learn, like, okay, I'm, I'm auditioning now. So I know the ins and outs a little bit. So, or if you, if you quote unquote, if you suck, you know, you yeah. actually know why you suck. Like, you need to do right. better with your acting, which is always good to take acting classes. Sure. Like, um, you know, my agent, you know, she has me enrolled in um, um, drama school, uh, Next Level Acting Studios in Houston, uh, mm-hmm. Deke Anderson. You know, he's my acting coach. Um, very great guy. He's actually in a lot of movies. Uh, Green Lantern with Ryan Reynolds. Uh, he's on his show, The Resident. Um, he's like a lot of gigs, an awesome guy. But, you know, with acting class, you learn, you develop this um, skill set, you develop a, a technique mm-hmm. because um, it's so much more than just being in front of a camera. Like, right. you know, understanding your character, why your character, where they are, who your character, like, you know, all these things, like what can you find in that character that you have within in yourself to portray to bring this to life mm-hmm. because if it looks like you're acting then you're doing it wrong so the conviction definitely mm-hmm. needs to be there mm-hmm. got it and for those that extra work is those are usually roles that are really just like an extra like a body part of like maybe an audience or something or a crowd you don't really have yeah. any lines for those works correct although there's also you know for extras there's also featured extra mm-hmm. like so with feature extra you get more camera time like, I have a buddy, you know, he was in Avengers Endgame. He played a drill sergeant. It was mm-hmm. a featured extra. But they wound up bumping him up that same day to a speaking role because he's a drill sergeant, and drill sergeants are supposed to speak. One, right. two, three, four. So he wound up getting bumped, bam, right then and there. Now he go from making this much, now he's making that much. Right. <laughs> all from just submitting for the right role at the right time. Mm-hmm. How do you find those the opportunities for featured extras? Is that something that's posted as well, or you kind yeah, of start as an extra? As well. okay. It's posted as well. Same thing. So you know, if you meet the requirements, you know, for feature extra, go for it mm-hmm. because that's the one that's going to give you camera time. And if you, like I said, still build that relationship because you never know. Like one thing I can say, whatever you audition for, whatever you're studying, is going to be way different on film. Right. They can change things. They could take scripts out, add scripts in. So again, like let's say if you have a featured extra role. It just so happened that day of filming, you know what? I want to take this line out. I want to get a line to this guy. Hey, you, come here. What's your mm-hmm. name? Okay, I'm going to bump you up from this role to this role, so I'm going to ha- add you to the roster. I've witnessed that happen too many times, like so many times. A lot of people, they they in the right place at the right time, all from having a feature role and, and, and patience, mm-hmm. patience. You know, once you get there, you know, you follow directions, you know, it, it'll definitely take you farther than you can imagine just from starting off from an extra walk me through the audition process like what is for the the person that's out there that's going out for their first audition what is something that you wish you knew and what should they do to prepare for their first audition (laughs) oh man i'm glad you asked because this is something that i learned in class okay (laughs) never ever 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 look into the camera when you're auditioning unless you're doing a commercial something if it's a film do not look at the camera don't look towards the camera. Like, a lot of people say, like, well, duh, hold on. Don't because, yes, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, some auditions, you have to look at the camera if you're doing some type of advertisement. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they want to see you. They want to see you portray this character. So don't look at, don't look at, don't even look above the camera. Look over here somewhere. Look over there. Look over there. But look down there. But don't look there. Don't look there. Don't look there. Don't even look there. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, so I mean, never look at the camera unless you're instructed to look at the camera. Mem- memorize your lines, for God's mm-hmm. sake. Memorize your <laughs> lines. Study. Study your character that you're auditioning for because cast and directors, they, they want to see confidence. Mm-hmm. They want to see confidence. They also want to see respect. Don't go in there arrogant, cocky. You're gonna, it's going to be all the reasons why nobody wants to work with you. Mm-hmm. So you got to be confident. You got to be respectable. You know, and, you know, you got to go in there ready. You got to go in there ready because 
and be willing to be teachable because from there they can tell you, okay, cut, let's change this out. I want you to be a little bit more aggressive. Okay, I want you to be a little bit more comedic. Be teachable because that's the whole thing about being an actor. You're being directed and you're going based on what's what's been written. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's pretty much all it is, following directions and being respectable and have the confidence to be able to portray that character as they're written. Is there such a thing as asking too many questions on the set? No. Mm, there question. is n- because they want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So from safety guidelines to like snacks and oh my God, snacks and food. Like that's, <laughs> they'll <laughs> feed you, they'll feed you. You have chefs, whatever you want to eat, they'll feed you. But like, you know, there's no, there's no such thing as asking too many questions. They want to make sure everybody is on the same page. Mm-hmm. And then you also talked about uh, SAG. So what are the requirements to becoming a member of, of SAG as an actor? Okay, so there's so many ways. There's so many ways that you could become um, part of the union. As an extra, if you was to do the minimum of three, I want to say three, three to four days of extra work on a SAG film, what they do is you get Tap Harley. Tap Harley is a contract. They send that contract from the production to SAG, so you become SAG eligible because you you made the requirements of doing a extra role of three to four SAG um, SAG eligible extra roles for this film or commercial. Mm-hmm. Now, if you have a lead or supporting role, all it takes is just, just lead or supporting. Any type mm-hmm. of principal role for a SAG film, you're automatically eligible to join SAG. Now, different different areas like different states have different requirements as far as your your fee. You have to pay like a um, uh, initiation fee. Um, I want to say Texas probably have the cheapest fee of joining SAG. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say Los Angeles is like three thousand um, dollars. Everywhere else is like around that ballpark, mm-hmm. but the state of Texas is a thousand dollars. So it's a little bit cheaper. It's a little bit cheaper. <laughs> and um, so with that, you know, that also helps you, you know, work more because you still have to pay your dues. Every actor pay, every SAG actor pays their dues, mm-hmm. where it's like monthly dues or yearly dues and everything. But you get that from, from working alone. Like, you know, I still get paid from commercials that I've shot two years ago. But like, they also so, get like benefits, right? Yes, they offer benefits. Okay. And all, like, just like, I mean, you're part of a union, so they'll take care of you. They'll definitely take care of you. They got like health insurance yes. and accident oh, wow. protection and stuff like that. I think if you work as a double and stuff like yeah. Absolutely. That's interesting. I didn't I did not know that. Man, where's the music industry with that kind of stuff? <laughs> need some need a union right? for, for well, musicians. Believe it or not, believe it or not, you could be a musician part of SAG. Oh yeah? How does that work? Well, even if you're an actor, like uh, like for example, Hugh Jackman, you know, he's also a singer. You know, he is? Yeah, he's a singer. He's a he's a oh, singer. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, he's he signed all his stuff in the Greatest Showman. That was him. What? Uh, Les Mills. Oh, I can't pronounce that. Les Mills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Russell Crowe. Yeah. Russell Crowe. Yeah. So he's, <laughs> That's he's crazy. SAG. He's SAG, and he's also a musician because in the SAG contract, you know, they pay you based on your performing skills. So if you're a singer, you know, performer, like all, there's literally a pay bracket for everything. DJs, engineers, producers, uh, rappers, singer, like, uh, you know, all there's a pay rate for each and every last thing that you can possibly do from the music industry to the film industry. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess because if you're in the industry, you do work on production in the movie, right? Soundtracks and stuff like that. So they have to. Okay. Uh-huh. So is that how you kind of become like you do work on the movie? Yep. Yeah. It's uh, what's, yeah. So it's, it's different contracts. It's different contracts for that. So if you like, if you work on that, you can still get Taft Harley in where you can get your concert to join the union. Cool. I'm very interesting. <laughs> and, and once you're part of SAG, do you, is that when is the right time to be start looking for an agent? Like you need to be part, be part of SAG first, look for an agent or how does that no. process? No? You should look for an agent once you've got uh, a decent resume of, of decent work and you, and you, you, you know that you're, you're, they can make money off you, that you're marketable. Um, like if you got um, decent amount of films, decent amount of commercial, decent like you know some work, because if you go for a legitimate agency, they want to see your headshots, they want to see your resume, 
They want to see your reels. Because anybody can fake it on their resume. It's like, oh, yeah, I worked on this, I worked on that. But they need reels. They need reels to see that, okay, this guy, this this woman or this man, they're, they're really are working. Mm-hmm. And they, they're in class, they're in drama school. So, yes, we can, we can work with this guy. So those are the requirements. And most agencies, they also require a cover letter. Uh, like, why you want to join us? Like, wh- where did you hear about us? So, like, with my contract with my agency and my agent, you know, I can also refer other actors and actresses to, you know, to come in and be signed by my agency and my agent. So, you know, um, I will always refer to anybody who's, you know, willing to work, who already get, who's, who's pretty much got their things ready to go. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's also going to be me putting my name out there and yeah. putting my neck on So. You know, if I if I put you in the door, you have to make sure that you have your headshots ready, your resume ready, your reels, everything, cover letter, all that. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you don't have to join. You don't have to be a part of the union to join. Um, you know, to be signed to an agent. You know, it, it'll be good, but you don't have to. As long mm-hmm. as you got the work to back it up, you're good. Right. I when you speak, we talk about referrals. I remember this rule I used to have when I used to work at this venue in Orlando, but like anyone that was an employee that I got trusted, like if they wanted to bring a friend in to work, 100%, I'll hire your friend. But if your friend gets in trouble, you get in trouble. If I have to fire your friend, I'm firing you. So if you're going to refer someone, better be good. And we always got good referrals because of that. <laughs> Just right, made me right. think of that. <laughs> definitely, what, man, definitely. What should be in a reel? Like how long is a reel and what, what should you put in that? Who's a reel? Uh, well, a reel is pretty much a final. Um, it's, it's it's the production. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's it's a clip of your work. Okay. Um, so it could be anywhere from thirty seconds to a minute. You yeah. know, like when you're joining an agent, they want to see a theatrical reel, a commercial reel. So you use all, you take all the reels from every movie that you was in, put it into like one reel, and that's your theatrical reel. Commercials, every commercial that you ever done. Now you don't want to just take the whole. But you only you just want to take the clip of your scene, mm-hmm. you know, of your scene. Put it all together, you know. Um, same thing with commercials. Just cut to your scenes, put it all all together for your commercial reels, and you got yourself a reel. And from there, you know, that's for you know for agency. Every agency have different requirements. Um, now, once you actually have like a, a agent and you're part of like LA casting or casting network your resume is a whole lot different from the resume that you submitted for an agent. This resume, you know, you have all your movies, TV shows, commercials, and your music, music videos. You can now coexist your yeah. music and everything because you're a recording artist. Mm-hmm. So now the, the great thing about the, this new resume now on the, this network with your agent, when the casting director click, click on this movie or click on this song, it'll actually pull up that song that they can listen to. It'll pull up that clip that they can watch. So it's a, it's pretty neat how to have everything set up now. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. And both of you guys like talked a lot about relationships right throughout this conversation. Like it's all about building relationships, whether it's with producers, with other actors, with agents, with people in the entertainment industry. What advice would you give on how to, and it's something I ask almost like every, every guest, but how do you build good, genuine relationships and like, how do you know you're not being, like you're being persistent and not giving up, but also that you're not being annoying when you're trying to build those relationships? Well, you know, one, just be you. Just be you. Like you, you never want to be somebody that you're not because you'll be surprised just how much the next person, if you're, if you're goofy, you, that, the next person may just be just as goofy as you are. Yeah. But, you know, be yourself. You know, make sure you come in wholeheartedly and you're not coming to be, you know, a scam artist and all that stuff because, you know, I do believe karma exists and I do believe everything comes full circle. So, mm-hmm. you know, make sure that your intentions are pure, mm-hmm. you know, because once you have the relationship success, that's going to come. That It's a it's a side effect. Right. When you have, you know, two or more people, you know, they put their heads together to get something done, the success is a side effect. So that's, that's going to happen. So that's, you know, that's going to be no questions asked. But, you know, a relationship, you know, that's something that can last forever because, mm-hmm. You know, you never want to burn bridges over misunderstandings and stuff like that. So, you know, you, you want to weigh out your options. So it's like, what's more important to you? Um, the relationship or the, the where, where, where you're trying to go? Because you got to remember, you know, this is always going to be there. That's, gonna, that's not going anywhere. Like, whatever, like, 
like money comes and go, you know, opportunities, it, it'll come, it'll come. If right. it came once, it'll come again. Right. But the relationship, friendship, sometimes you might not meet another person like that who's going to ride for you. So, you know, you keep those people close to you and you're going to always come up with a solution to get to that, to get to that goal. Mm -hmm. As I am a naturally self-conscious and suspicious person <laughs> and that, that come that stems from being multicultural, coming from a different you know country and stuff like that. So I struggle with that particular aspect of it a lot. Even when I first met Justin, I was like, I want to shout out and this dude <laughs> because, <laughs> like you know, to a certain degree, you know, you've always been told act like you've been there before. Right now, I feel like it's completely acceptable to be happy and you know and excited about an opportunity, but at the same time, I feel like that excitement and happiness shouldn't get in the way of your rational thinking. So just because you just met somebody doesn't mean like everything is going to happen automatically. Like I use my time and conversations that I have with Justin is to learn as much about like all the industries, like all his experience in the music. Like I'm always just asking questions or we're discussing something I'm, uh, and, I, and I, I like to get his, you know, opinion of it. But honestly, what came down to uh, from, working with like with different people in the music industry or just with different artists like i i kind of waited like i kind of almost weigh it out like is what i'm about to it is what i am risking more important to me than what i could potentially gain mm -hmm. from from this interaction right so mm -hmm. and that usually translates in the form of money obviously mm -hmm. so for example like if you meet, meet a producer who's done work and he's asking $500 for his time. And you obviously come to him like, man, like, do I really, like, is it really worth it? Do I want to spend it? And stuff like that. But for me, I'm like, I spend money on stupid things a lot, you know, <laughs> Same. as it is. So is this $500, like, really going to stop me from, like, is it really that important into what it could potentially be? Like, what if he's, like, what if this is the song that is going to, be the thing for me what if this is what launches me what if meeting or working with this person will put, like there's so much more potential on the positive side that what you're potentially risking is, once you get a clear-headed perspective broad perspective of it i feel like most of the time you can weigh the cons and pros and it'll come out that it's usually worth it obviously like scam is, like those things will naturally happen but like a bad experience is still an experience you can still learn mm -hmm. from it absolutely I think we covered a lot of great information for the listeners. I think you're going to learn a lot from this, from this interview or from this conversation. Uh, let me ask you guys a few more quick, fun, like wrap up questions. I asked everyone, I don't think I've had these uh, just in the last time we, we talked, but tell me about your guys' first concert that you've been to or your first memorable concert experience. Hmm. You said concert? Yeah. You know, uh, I've only been to like one concert, or was it two? I wouldn't count. I wouldn't count up in the concert. First concert I went to, I was a kid. It was for my sister's birthday. Uh, the artist uh, Tank. You know, okay. He came, Tank. Yeah, he came. He came across the pier out here, and you know he performed. This was like 1990. I cannot remember. But like I do remember all the women was like going crazy, and I didn't understand why. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't understand why. I'm like. He's just a guy. He's just a guy. But then, <laughs> you know, over the years, I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I I, I, I see. You know, I, I get it. Okay, all right. And um, like the next one, you know, it was Yolanda Adams. I wouldn't really call it a concert because we also performed for her, but she did perform. But I love Yolanda Adams. Oh my God! I yeah. I, I gave her a hug. I said, "Please marry me." I said, <laughs> I, said, I, said I said, "Please marry me." I was like, "Oh my God!" She said, oh, "You so adorable." Man, I was like, "I'm so serious. Please marry me." I said, Please marry me. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like it's like, man. But other than that, you know, I've always there's there are concerts I've always wanted to go to that I never went to. I know a lot of people don't like the band Nickelback, but. My Ooh. my dad, <laughs> my dad got me hooked on Nickelback, and you know I love Nickelback. You know I, I love Chad Kroger, and um, look at this photograph. Yeah, look at this photograph, and it's like so. I've always wanted to go to a Nickelback concert. I really yeah, have. All I, 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 wanted to. I don't understand the hate of Nickelback. I, yeah, I guess like, they're generic, but like generic is average. So yeah, well, that means most people like it. But whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's, dad, it's generic with a. Oh, don't they have a Diamond album? 
or close to yeah, it. Yeah, like. I'm generic with a diamond album, right? But but then again, if I can, thankfully, to due to recording and editing, we can edit this whole part out and just forget that you ever said that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, my, my dad, you know, he had me hook on Nickelback. He had me hook on Three Doors Down. He had me hook hey! on Alan Smith. So right. even though I'm a pop and be honest, my dad was a, a rock artist. So it was like, so it was like very like. So everybody thought I was gonna follow my dad's footsteps, or my brother, or my sister. But like, no, my dad loved rock, but I love rock. He can make rock music. I can't. But like, you know, I, I love listening to it. Like, I mean, man, it's it's good. I love it. <laughs> I think the most memorable the most memorable con concert I went to was Kendrick Lamar and the Good Kid, Mad nice. City tour. Really? At the Verizon Theater and uh, and, and down in Dallas, uh, whole TDE was there. J Rock, Schoolboy Q. Um, we were at the we were at the front too. Like I didn't get to meet him or anything like that, but it was great. The dude knew how to do it. And honestly, that's when you know when you're hitting artists when you just put the mic out and the, the crowd just chanting the song for yeah. you. You're just like catching a breath. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that's probably the most memorable. Kendrick Lamar is one of the few artists I've seen where he had barely any production and barely anything on stage, like. No, no yeah. hype man, no, nothing. It was no just gimmicks, him. Nothing, yeah. No gimmicks. It was just him. And he had the audience in the palm of his hand. And it's insane. Like, sometimes it's nice to have these big productions, but at the end, like, if you got it, you got it. And I think Kendrick Lamar is one of those. He just has that it. whole album was unique, man. It was a story from the beginning to the end. Yeah. I think that's why it was. Yeah. What, what is something that you guys are currently really into that's – doesn't have to be business related, ideally not, but maybe like an app, a TV show, an artist, exercise, food, whatever. What's something you guys are currently really in, uh, into? To be honest, there's something that's like, now this is probably off the topic too, but maybe, no, maybe still perfect, on topic. Perfect. <laughs> but like, so for the past month or so, and I, I, I just can't catch a break, man. Like, there's this Mexican restaurant. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, it's in Groves. It's called Sylvia's Tacos. I kid you not. Man, I've been wanting to try their tacos for the longest since they opened. But their hours suck. It's like, they open from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's like, like right now, it's already 3 o'clock, so I'm not getting it today. Breakfast break tacos. <laughs> it's a pizza. I mean, tacos. It's a taco. Yeah, I know. But I was like, oh my, like, I just, like, I, I want to try one of the tacos because there was on the news. My friends posted about it on Instagram. I'm looking at the tacos. They, they look beautiful, delicious, <laughs> all of it. It will make my day if I could just somehow, maybe if I set my alarm so I can like catch them on time tomorrow. But I just really want to try their tacos, man. Like it's it's legitimate tacos. It's not the Tex Mex. These are actual Mexican tacos. Huh? Mm, my day will be complete good. if I can if I get just one, just one. Is what you got? You got to do it now. It's out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, me, I two things that happened most recently. I built a whole microphone booth inside the studio, like an mm. isolated one. Nice. Uh, you know, just so now I can actually listen to the artist live as they record without it bleeding into the mic. And <laughs> I discovered Netflix Shuffle, and so I am currently nine episodes into the Umbrella Academy. Okay. Um, and that has been a worthy investment in my time. Normally, it's, it's very hard for me to catch a new show, but it was worthy. Nice. Unlike, unlike Tiger King, this is worth your time in this game. <laughs> <laughs> if, what are the books, documentaries, or podcasts you share the most? Philosophize this. What was it? Philosophize this. What one was that? It's like a philosophy podcast that goes um, get real nerdy on you, but uh, cool. it basically starts off at a time of the, uh, where the Greek Greek philosophers like Aristotle, Plato, and everything like that, and he breaks down and ex in and explains how those different philosophies were formed. At, at the time and what caused it and he goes through all of them all the way to like Nietzsche and Carl Schmitt all the way to modern Keynesian and so it's um, more of a if you wanted like a perspective on a societal thing I guess mm -hmm. and how, how we function and that's why I, I like to listen to that. That's interesting I like it. Justin what about you? 
to be honest, <laughs> I actually, well, yeah, I, I don't really have time, but I've been sharing <laughs> a lot of your episodes. Ah, oh, thank you. Appreciate I've been that. sharing a lot of yours to a lot of people. I've mentioned you, I will, to, I every, I mentioned oh, you, you to so many people, man, like so many people. Oh, because so like, um, like I have the, I have like the links, like, um, like on my websites, you know, I even have a link like on my resumes from my, my agent to see. Oh, wow. So like I told a lot of people, I told a lot of people about, about your podcast. But um, like uh, that as right now, I can't uh, I can't really watch or listen to anything too much because like you know filming is trying to get on the way. So right now, like they like every day we have like a meeting. Like yesterday we had a long meeting for, and then now me and my castmates we have to start rehearsal soon. So it's like right now they they got me. I'm like yeah, locked and sure. trained right now. <laughs> well, well, I appreciate that. Thanks for for the love and the support, man. I really appreciate oh, sure that. Thing. I got. I do have a podcast recommendation for you, uh, for both of you guys. It's really super interesting. So we mentioned Hugh Jackman and 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 singing and everything, right? Uh, and kind of encompasses like everything that you guys do. But uh, his interview with Tim Ferriss on T the Tim Ferriss Show that was such a good interview. That was probably my favorite episode I've listened to so far this year. And I listen to lots of podcasts. I have to check that out. So Tim Ferriss interviewing Hugh Jackman. That was such a great episode, and just like learning who the, who the man is. Got it. Got it. Very inspiring. But uh, all right, so one of the last questions I have is, what is something that you'd like to see change about the entertainment industry? Uh, it's really philosoph philosophical. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I like to see change in the entertainment industry is a better doorway of opportunity for upcoming artists. Like, even though most people think that oh, there's one exists, like not exactly, because being that music or a film, whatever, it, it all boils down to art, and art is subjective, yep. um, so to speak. Like uh, we had this talk like like a little while ago today. Like you may have like an opera, somebody who loves opera music, they may have a bias review on a hip hop song. Mm -hmm. So let's say you know, if the, if the, the door of opportunity was a little bit more broader because, you know, I feel like there's audience for every style of music. There's an audience for every style of music. So whether it's uh, from rap to hip hop, R&B, pop, alternative rock, um, anything, there's a, there's going to be an audience for that genre. There's going to, all it takes is that one song that's, that's going to connect to them. Especially with everything being so accessible. Yeah, everything being so um, accessible. So I feel like there should be more of a, a better doorway than to, and like, and it's, you know, you got a lot of, even from film, even with music, there's a lot of scam places like, you know, um, pay for this and we could get you some streams and everything, but are they actually going to be getting streamed or is these like bot streams? Because if it's bot mm -hmm. streams, then you're not actually connecting to the people. You're not able to, because, you know, it's song, organic. yeah, it's not organic. And, you know, songs, you know, songs have a message. Films have a message. So, you know, you want to connect with the people. Now, I feel like that's what music is all about, is connecting to mm -hmm. somebody out there that can relate, that can, that's motivated, that can get motivated by the song, that, you know, that you can inspire. Like, man, I heard about this guy. Man, he's all the way from where? And he's doing, mm. man, if he could do it, then I could do it. Or I heard about this guy. He's, then I could, so it's like, you know, it's a better doorway of opportunity for artists to be better exposed. Absolutely. And, and, and Kyle, before you answer that question, I just want to, Tur turn teacher mode real quick for the, the audience that's listening. What you mentioned bot plays, right? It's, you can go literally on Fiverr, pay five or 10 bucks and get a couple of thousand views or streams on your music. However, that is the absolute worst thing you can do. Like you're better off to learn how to really run digital ads. And here's the reason why this is terrible. One, people in the industry are going to know when something's fake views because of the engagement with the content. And then two, once you start building your career, there's something called an algorithm on all these platforms. And if you go on Spotify, you have uh, this artist also sounds like or similar artists and on YouTube videos, there's suggested videos on podcasts, there's suggested podcasts. If you are buying fake streams, you are getting grouped with other people that are buying fake streams and 
I'll totally admit when I first started podcasting four years ago and didn't notice stuff, I wanted to boost my podcast and I spent 10 bucks on one of those, those fake things before. And to this day, four days later or four years later, if you look at similar podcasts on Apple podcasts, none of them have anything to do with music business. And that's my, one of my biggest regrets and mistakes that I've made. So anyone that's listening, please don't make that mistake because you're going to get grouped with the wrong uh, like content that's similar and it's just really going to hurt your career down the road um mm -hmm. just wanted to add that as a little teaching lessons for for the audience that's 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 gold right there man. <laughs> and, and I, I really don't have much to add on top of that accessibility and keeping it natural and organic is really the best thing you can do for yourself mm -hmm. i mean there's a time and place to spend money and there's a time and place to invest in your craft and network and network, network. So, Absolutely, yeah. Because, yeah, got to network, man. Like, like I was talking, like, we was talking about this too, you know, like, you know, for artists, do a lot of research, learn how to get in touch with other music bloggers, you know, network, you know, kind of get that buzz going. Um, because, you know, it's either it's going to be, the worst thing a person could say is no. Right. But you probably might get a yes. But you won't know yeah. until you actually try and go and just network. You know, build a relationship up. Build a relationship up. Absolutely. Yeah. And before I ask you guys the, the last question, what's the best way for people to connect with you guys? Like where like plug all your social platforms and maybe what's what you have about to come out and everything. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, you can go on Google, you can type in Justin P. Slaughter and every social media link is on there from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, um, Apple Music, iTunes, Spotify, everything is going to be on, everything's going to be on Google. Um, luckily, you know, since he, he's featured on Rob and Me, it'll be on, it'll be on Google. So, um, but if they want to go on Instagram, it's Justin P. Slaughter. But, you know, again, um, Google pretty much, they have everything on there for me. So it's like, it's pretty accessible now. Yeah, I mean, you can Google MC King Khan. I'm the only MC King Khan, I think, so far, but as far as like my social media handles, uh, it's um, Instagram.com slash KingConENT, short for entertainment. And that's my handle on everything, Facebook, Twitter. So it's KingConENT. Awesome. And I'll put links to everything that um, over to you guys' social sites in the show notes for the episode and the things we talked about today too. And then before I ask you the last question, I just want to thank you guys so much for sharing so much good information for the listeners. And I think people are going to learn a lot from this episode. And, and thanks, Justin, for inviting uh, King Khan on the episode. Oh, yeah, this uh, guy's cool. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice to meet you. Right. And, and thank you for the, for the lessons today. And thanks for you, what you guys do and for sharing. Thanks, and, for thanks for having us. Yeah, and then the question I asked at the end, we'll see if this is the, the same answer for, for Justin. I'll have to pull it up while you're answering it. But what's your definition of making it? Oh, man, the definition of making it? Doing what you love, loving what you do. Don't let don't let nobody tell you anything otherwise because they don't have the life that you're living. They don't know your journey. Only you know your journey. And you know, you know you're making it when you're able to buy groceries with the money you made from what you're doing that you love. Different feeling. Uh, for me, bills on auto pay, family taken care of, creative freedom to do what I wish. I love it. So let me share this uh, with you guys. So I'll end the podcast here. But uh, Justin, you are consistent. Do what you love what? and love what you do. <laughs> almost. <laughs> so it's almost like you read it before we. Uh, <laughs> before we I, I didn't. Know. I really didn't. Oh my <laughs> If you're not doing what you love, you're not making it. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> uh, oh wow. Consistency. That's what it's all about. <laughs> that's, that's the theme. That's the theme. I love it. 